I wrote this very early on in the book. Chapter one is about assessment. Just understand if this is something that you actually want to do. Do you want to be a business owner, right? Or do you want to be a CEO? Which in some ways are not fundamentally different. You're running like a small business, which has its own set of challenges and uh, unique things you have to deal with. But understand, is that like the lifestyle that you actually want? Or is there a better one out there for you? And make that decision as quickly as possible. I'm in a number of peer groups, which I also talk a lot about in the book and why they're so important. And I've seen people that are in situations where maybe they're really financially successful, but they didn't make the right choice around if they're a business owner and they want to have that, you know, kind of personal skin in the game. Or if they're a CEO where they don't quite control their destiny, but they also don't have the same, you know, downside of a personal guarantee. And I've seen people get that choice wrong and getting that choice wrong has a lot of cost to it. But could you tell me just a little bit about your journey through to writing this book, Great It Done? Uh, just 16 years uh, in the ETA space, more or less. Started it before it was ETA, fitness franchising, to business school at Chicago Booth, to uh, industrial services business, to uh, now just kind of giving back to the community with a book and investing and board seats and doing a PhD on entrepreneurship through acquisition. So all that, uh, all that good stuff, just a humble small business owner for 16 years and Life's good. Very cool. Is there anything that you would uh, like to focus on before we get rolling? No, uh, not really. I'll have like my usual, I mean, I, you get it all the time. I'm sure I'll get, I'll, I'll hit my like four or five book talking points. And aside from that, just look forward to having a fun conversation. Cool. Well, let's dive right in then. So what does entrepreneurship mean to you? Entrepreneurship, you know, it's so interesting. One of your previous guests, Michael Morris, I love the guy to death. I went on uh, to one of his entrepreneurship seminars before and afterwards, we emailed back and forth about what it means to be an entrepreneur. I actually write this in the book, gridditdone.com, available for 99 cents through the end of May, step-by-step -step for how to buy and run a business. To me, entrepreneurship is about, uh, to me, an entrepreneur is somebody that takes action. Entrepreneurship, which Michael Morris and I agree upon, is someone who seeks to maximize returns while mitigating risk as much as possible. So that's how I think about entrepreneurship and something which you mentioned early on is that you don't have to be a business owner to be an entrepreneur. You could be an entrepreneur as a father. You could be an entrepreneur in a big company. It is a fundamental mindset. And to me, Mr. Lovejoy, it's about taking action. Great answer. I'd agree with all of that. You mentioned that you've been in the ETA or entrepreneurship through acquisition space uh, since well before it was called that for about 16 years. What led to you going that route instead of, say, the, the startup phase? It actually started when I was in high school, if you'd believe that. I grew up in the Bay Area, about 15 minutes from uh, San Francisco International Airport. And my older brother, and my older brother, he's a true entrepreneur. He just thinks about, he's a, in the sense that he has very creative ideas. I'll say that. He can think about things out of the box. And our parents... When my brother could start driving as part of our allowance, they made us earn our allowance. You know, we were not entitled kids said, hey, we want you to drive us to the airport and save us the 20 bucks it takes for a taxi cab. So my brother started doing that. And then family friends would be like, hey, can you um, drive us to the airport? And they would pay him for it. Then, of course, I got my license a few years later. He went off to college. I took that business and I just expanded it to my parents, friends. And, um, and I started to realize that people would like pay a huge premium to not have to take a taxi cab to the airport. And I was able to make pretty good money from this. And this is, you know, in 1999, 2000, 2001. And what was so interesting is that, um, and the best part is that I'd make money from the actual route, you know, like whatever, pay me 20 bucks. People would tip me so much money too, because they just did not like taxi cabs. So at that point I learned the power of buying into something that already exists and then just expanding it as opposed to starting something from scratch. Now, unfortunately, I went off to college and I left that business behind. But, you know, we definitely tap into some of that pre Uber demand, which was pretty cool. So I learned the lesson when I was in high school. Interesting. And you went to Berkeley after that. Is that correct? Roll on you bears, baby. Yeah. And studying econ. What made you choose econ? Economics. What ultimately to me, to, and I'll answer that question directly, it was my grandma. My grandmother, because to me, what really drives grit and what really drives, you know, me to do things, it's all about relationships, right? 
my grandmother, fantastic woman, she graduated from UC Berkeley in 1933. Don't quote me on that in economics at the age of 16. Think about that for a second. Second youngest woman to graduate until she got passed up in the mid nineties. So uh, let's just say I wanted to make grandma proud by going to Berkeley and getting a degree in economics. And it's another reason that I'm doing work uh, on a PhD in entrepreneurship through acquisition now. Same thing, it's that relationship I had with my grandmother, Sylvia, bless her heart, she passed away a number of years ago that inspires me to want to um, you know, go off and do great things in the, in the academic space. That's beautiful. My grandma is my hero too. She's the one that inspired me to go after my MBA. Yeah. It was about eight years or so between your degrees. Uh, what did you do in the time between graduating with an econ economics degree and going to pursue your MBA at Chicago Booth? I was at San Francisco's second oldest pub, a place called the Old Ship Saloon. It has a really nice mast of a ship that sunk in 1851 during the gold rush. When I was at Berkeley, I'd taken an unpaid internship at a secondary venture capital firm in downtown San Francisco, which I eventually flipped into a full-time job. And uh, after a very short amount of time, David, I had about 100,000 bucks in the bank. So I was very blessed to be in that situation. And uh, I, I, I was a spreadsheet jockey doing deal sourcing, knew that wasn't for me. I was out at this happy hour with my older brother and another friend that worked at a, a small private equity firm. They were doing deal sourcing in the franchise space, and they were looking at this franchise or called Anytime Fitness. Now, my parents met Heard about running it. a marathon. So, you know, fitness is in my DNA. And I was like, this sounds like a pretty cool thing. So long story short, I quit my job. Three of us put our equity into it with a vision to open up dozens of clubs in the California Central Valley. So I ended up uh, going and doing that before business school. But ask me about how that went as, as next question, if you want to, because there's some cool learnings that I think will be valuable for your audience there. Well, you read my mind. I was going to ask you how that went. So please continue. Yeah. So in the Central Valley, now, one thing is that opened up the club in December 2007 in Sacramento, right when the Great Recession was beginning. But David, that was only at most 20 percent of the problem. Other 20 percent of it was I didn't know how to run a business, so I had to kind of learn on the ground. But the biggest mistake that we made is that we thought we knew better than the franchisor. Franchisor said, open up a fitness center in a small town. You know, think a town of like 20,000 people an hour outside Vancouver with limited competition. Don't go to a big market. Now, to be frank, two of us were like totally down for a small town, but one of us just couldn't get comfortable with it. So we opened in a jumbo market and the club ended up, you know, being a mediocre outcome. Now what happened though, is that I dressed up in Anytime Fitness's Captain Running Man purple superhero suit in the, in the okay. Sacramento summertime heat, 99, 100 degree weather. I pounded the pavement, sold a bunch of memberships to uh, high schoolers and students that flipped into automatic renewal, got the club to make a couple thousand bucks a month. But then two things happened. One, I knew exactly what we'd done wrong. We chose a bad market. Two, I had a realization at that point that bless my two partners' hearts, they kept their jobs. They were, you know, in San Francisco working in finance. I was the one who was out in the field, you know, sweating my you know what off to sell memberships. And I decided that, you know what, if I'm going down this route, I want to be the one that's in control and I want to own, you know, all the upside of what I do. And then I parlayed that uh, mediocre outcome. The club made money, but it wasn't a good IRR, it was not a good return on investment. And I parlayed that through some lucky situations which I could talk through to open up additional clubs that I had all the equity in and become a top performing anytime fitness multi-unit club owner operator in the California Central Valley. Speaking of deal sourcing, what did you learn in those years of deal sourcing that maybe a lot of people get wrong when they're trying to, to deal source, source deals? Well, one thing about deal sourcing, which I think is critical, and I, and I would be honest, if I said that I, you know, learned this a bit more, I learned this a bit more later is that, you know, for people that are in the ETA space right now, there's no excellent data on this. And so I can just talk to you from it, from an anecdotal standpoint, if you really want to go out and buy a business, the fastest route to do it is to focus on it full time and use an intermediary. Um, simple as that. So you can get as sexy as you want to with proprietary deal sourcing and all that good stuff. And there's a lot of unique ways people are successful with it all the time. But if an individual is serious about becoming a business owner, my strong guidance is 
focus on it full time, go all into it and utilize an intermediary. We can talk through some of the tactical steps for how to build credibility in this and that. And I, I put a lot of that in the book, uh, grid it done, you know, nine step-by-step process for how to buy, grow and run a small business. Um, mm-hmm. 99 cents griddedone.com through the end of May. I kind of go through some of the things in that, but two key takeaways, go all in, use an intermediary. That's probably the quickest way to becoming a business owner in the current environment that we operate in. Okay. Yeah. Good to hear that. Cause I know that's quite the bottleneck for many people. It's really difficult to find good quality leads. A lot of the databases are fallow is hundreds of thousands of people are kind of combing through them and a variety of, uh, like alignment there in terms of deal size and quality of the fines, et cetera. So, yeah, because, you know, the thing about entrepreneurial business ownership or entrepreneurship through acquisition is that let's be clear, the silver tsunami is real Mm. and we live in a time where there is a lot of secession going on and it's not something that, you know, was like, oh, this was really hot five years ago. It's hot right now. It'll be hot for, I think, I mean, I, I never predict the future, but I think it'll be hot for the, you know, for next three, five, 10 years, because when people started talking about the silver tsunami 15 years ago, the the original hypothesis was business owners are going to retire and sell their businesses when they're 60. It didn't really happen that way. Now people say they're going to do it when they're 70, which is now maybe they'll wait till they're 80. So there is good opportunities to buy these businesses. In addition, because of, you know, people, well, people like me to an extent, but because of, you know, buy and build and Walker Diebel and Cody Sanchez and, you know, the, the fact that things are proliferated at MBA programs, there's a lot of people looking for businesses now, but there's also a lot of supply. So I just think it's a good time to be in the space. And um, even outside of that, by the way, there's always great franchise opportunities to buy into as well. So it's definitely a good time yeah. to be an ETA, but let's be clear. It's all fun and games until you can't find a business to buy, right? And uh, and that's certainly the the biggest challenge and the and the hardest part the hardest part of the process. Given so much time in the space, have you seen any kind of trends? Like when I first became aware of it, HVAC was all the buzz, and then all of a sudden the uh, um, there there was like some change there as more and more people started pouring into that space. Uh, the multiples were a little bit higher for the buyer, um, so that became less attractive than it was say five years ago. But have you um, seen any kind of uh, areas that that lend themselves particularly well to ETA these days? One thing about the ETA space, which is, I'll give two examples to make the point. History repeats itself. Have you read uh, Buy and Build? Yeah. So what was the industry that he started in? Oh, shoot. That's a while ago. Um, I remember he was the EO, Entrepreneurs Organization. Shoot. I don't remember the, the industry. But one of the first businesses he bought was a printing business, right? If you go back to the traditional search fund world, um, there was a guy named uh, Jim Southern, right? Who kind of helped found search funds at Harvard in 1984. The first industry that he bought into was printing. So you have buy and build in 2019 and you have Jim Southern in 1984 did the exact same industry in what's that 35 years later, right? So history repeats itself in the ETA space. Another example, um, an individual named David Dotson. David Dodson, you know, Stanford professor, very successful guy, yeah. ran for Senate in Wyoming, very big in the ETA space. So one of his first acquisitions was Wind River Environmental. They did septic pumping. They're now a private equity backed on the East Coast, doing a lot of roll-ups in the space. Well, so he did septic pumping. I bought an industrial service business that did septic pumping and grease trap pumping, among other things, and I was highly successful with it. So you have Wind River, which don't quote me in it, but I believe that was from the 90s, and then you have getting Hawkins, you know, my company from 2019. So just take that as two examples in the ETA space, history can repeat itself. Um, and I think when you talk about things like HVAC, that's like, you know, hot and sexy now, you know, HVAC rollups have been going on for a good amount of time. So I think that it's important to look to the past of what people have done in ETA as like an actual fair representation of what might happen in the future. So don't always feel a need to reinvent the wheel. It's very fair just to go to back and look at things that have worked before and apply them to the future. So something to think about there. Going to the MBA, you went to, as far as as ratings go, one of the best MBAs in the world, I think um, somewhere in the top 20 rankings at Chicago Booth. What was that experience like going into the MBA, coming from another top school like Berkeley? Could you just describe kind of that that whole season in your life? Yeah, it was great. I mean, I was a... 
I was a successful, you know, fitness club owner from California. But one thing about California, I love California. They're exceptionally innovative at making it hard to run a small business. So I was just ready to kind of get out of California for a bit. So when I came to Chicago, I got lucky, very lucky, because right when I got there is when, through no power of my own, Chicago Booth was getting involved in the ETA space. So when I was there, I got to run the ETA group. I got to plan, help plan in conjunction with Polsky Center, the first ETA conference in 2014. And I go back every single year. I never miss it. And more importantly, I got to TA the first ETA class at Chicago Booth taught by two first-time adjuncts, which turned into like a 40-hour a week endeavor, designing the curriculum and doing class logistics. But it was completely a transformational experience for me. And it really inspired me to want to go out and do more in the ETA space. So I self-funded, bought the industrial services business, had a killer return. And after that course, I said that I need to go back because I was so inspired by that experience that I want to be an adjunct professor of ETA at some point as well. And now I am at Case Western Reserve University. I still stay very involved with Chicago Booth, but I teach this stuff to executives, MBAs, and uh, likely undergrads starting in the fall as well. So I have a chance to get yeah. back. And the key takeaway that I think is useful to hear from that is that what really drives grit, what really drives doing awesome things in life, for me, it's always come from one thing. It has come from the relationships that I've cultivated. And it's always people that inspire me. And in this case, it was those two first-time adjuncts that really were the fuel of so much of what I did after business school. So I'm forever grateful for that. That's a really amazing sentence you just shared. I'll definitely try to highlight that. And I, I've, I relate. I lived in Japan for a while. And they have a more group oriented culture. And I noticed that the long hours are lessened when you do it in company. And I do think it's all about people at the end of the day. So it's nice to hear that uh, that resonated with you as well during that time. Yeah. And, and it's a, oh, and it's, um, and then, so right now I'm doing a, a PhD on entrepreneurship through acquisition at Case Western Reserve University. And, you know, one key aspect that I study of it, and I've studied this from the seller satisfaction standpoint. I'm currently studying it from the operator standpoint and eventually we'll study it from the pre-practitioner standpoint is just the role that relationships play in satisfaction levels for sellers that sell businesses for current owners that operate businesses. I just think that relationships are a critical part of this entire journey. And I'm not the first to think this, I mean, read the Harvard happiness study, right? Ah, life's all about relationships, but yeah, I think it's hundred percent true, both on a fulfillment standpoint, and my untested hypothesis is that it's also true on an effectiveness and performance standpoint as well. So we can, uh, we can come back and talk about that when that research is done in a couple of years, a couple of years going forward. So there's a bit of, I don't know if I call it pushback, but uh, there's a large cohort of people who think that school in its current form is overrated and overpriced. And someone who's gone through some of the best schools, certainly in the country, if not the world, I'm curious what, what you would say to that. Do you, do you think part of that is true? Do you think there's something misunderstood? How would you defend and what, like, how is school useful for you? Uh, school's been very useful for me just because of the people that I've met. I don't think that going to school is something that people should do or shouldn't do. Just if someone's, if I give myself advice from 20 years ago, and I'm 40, just FYI, 22 years ago, and I'm 18, I would just say the sooner in my life that I can get in touch with congruently what I want to accomplish with my life, the more I can align to living to my, towards my ideal self. And that ideal self could require going to school because maybe my ideal self is I wanted to you know, follow grandma's footsteps and be a tenured professor, in which case going to school would completely make sense, right? But maybe that's not the case. Maybe you know, my congruent self is that, no, oh, I just like, <laughs> I want to like own a bakery because I like cookies a lot, you know, and in that case, it wouldn't require going to school. It would require, you know, going to culinary school or just going out and, you know, uh, raising money to open up a bakery. So it just depends on what the individual wants to do if school mm. actually makes sense. Now, in the case of entrepreneurship through acquisition and entrepreneurial business ownership, which is just another way of saying self-funded entrepreneurship acquisition, I see a lot of people that spend a lot of time, that spend a lot of money, whether it be getting an MBA, whether it be uh, going to weekend workshops, whole nine yards from there. So the reason I wrote this book, Grid It Done, gridditdone.com, 99 cents through the end of May, is that 
essentially spend three hours and then spend a dollar. Eventually it'll go to eight bucks after May and read about what it's actually like to be a business owner. It's a nine step process for how to do it from start to finish. But what I also did is, you know, I love the books that are out there in the space, Buy and Build, uh, Yan Simmons' book, HBR Guide to Buy and Business. They're all fantastic. I recommend those to everybody. But what I thought one thing where I could help fill the literature gap is that I actually mix in my personal anecdotal experiences of running businesses for 16 years so that people get a sense of what the business owner life is actually like. And success could look like deciding, no, I don't want to I don't want to be a business owner. That's a lot of work. You know, it's not for me. I love my business owner friends, but that's not for me. Or it could be, no, I actually want to do this because ultimately the autonomy, the freedom, the relationships, and the view of what government, good government can look like, make this a really compelling option to look at. Because at the end of the day, and I'm going to say this from a very American term, forgive me, to be a better American to me is to be an entrepreneurial business owner. And that's why I get so excited about introducing as many people to this route as possible. Looking at your your background, you're very much steeped in ETA and entrepreneurship. Like you said, basically coming out even, even before you, you went into undergrad. Could you talk to me about the Sandbox VR project that you're a partner of? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Pre-pandemic, Sandbox wanted to get involved in uh, franchising, basically. Uh, so someone that I knew knew that I was pretty involved in franchising. So we did a, a partnership where we um, opened up one of their locations in the Bay Area with the vision to, um, you know, kind of get involved in that franchise side of things. Then the pandemic hit, which changed everything. But I still uh, and so I, I still uh, that so, so didn't franchise back then for obvious reasons. Uh, now they are out growing quickly. And um, I think that for anyone interested in that likes VR and likes franchising or just likes franchising, Sandbox VR is a fantastic opportunity to get involved. And you got to have some net worth um, and you certainly have to have some good liquidity, but, and there's great opportunities in the US and abroad to, uh, to get involved in that. So fantastic franchising opportunity. And I was just blessed that I was able to get involved in that early. Um, and it's kind of fun. I mean, it's like so, there's some pretty big name investors in Sandbox VR, like Anderson Horowitz. I'm like, yeah, I got to co-invest in Anderson Horowitz and it's going nice and well. So, yeah, I got involved in that one. Um, you know, when was that? 2016, Great. 2017, 2018. So that's a lot of fun. Okay. And are you? In, how many investments are you involved with right now? Uh, a lot, to say the least. What I generally like to do from an investment standpoint is that... I like to back people that are doing self-funded entrepreneurship through acquisition or buying or going to become franchisees. I like people to have SBA seven set in the U S have SBA seven, a loans so that there's personal guarantees. So they have skin in the game. Then my first thing I tell everybody is I, if I were you, I would not take any outside equity and deals. I would hold on to all of it and use the equity later. Quite frankly, if you do though need it for whatever reason, then I will, you know, write a check. Typically I'll write not huge checks, but 50 to hundred K and I'll help people fill that SBA seven, a gap taking a minority position. So they are the owner. I like to empower business owners as opposed to, I think about it as four fundamental avatars. One is you're an employee. Employees are great. They're the backbone of all companies and of the economy. The good ones get promoted. The bad ones find the door. Then you have equity employees. Think about that as being a CEO or a traditional search fund CEO. You work on the business, not in the business, ultimately, though, and you create equity value, but ultimately you don't control your destiny. And it's not a bad thing, but it's just it's one avatar. Third avatar is a business owner. That's where you own your upside. You're in control of your destiny, but you spend more time working on the in the business than you do on the business. And oftentimes the business owns you more than vice versa. I've been in that position before and it's great. I love being a business owner. With that said, better options to be an entrepreneurial business owner where you have the upside, you control your calendar, you still work on the business and not in the business. And that's where you can truly live what I think is the American or the Canadian dream, right? Because despite what we hear with entrepreneurial business ownership, you know, the American and the Canadian dream, they are alive and well. It is as simple as that. So to answer, I kind of went off on what your question was there. 
Uh, but to answer your question, if someone wants to go out and buy a business, then you know they're looking to fill that SBA equity gap. I'm happy to you know write small checks to help them to help them do that. Okay, yeah. So you're investing in a lot of different people, a lot of different ventures. Speaking about the the person looking for investment, what what should they check in about themselves to know that they're ready for for seeking investment? Like, what do you as the investor kind of test them on? Yeah. So first thing is. Uh, I wrote this very early on in the book. Chapter one is about assessment. Just understand if this is something that you actually want to do. Do you want to be a business owner, right? Or do you want to be a CEO? Which in some ways are not fundamentally different. You're running like a small business, which has its own set of challenges and uh, unique things you have to deal with. But understand, is that like the lifestyle that you actually want? Or is there a better one out there for you? and make that decision as quickly as possible. I, I'm in a number of peer groups, which I also talk a lot about in the book and why they're so important. And I've seen people that are in situations where maybe they're really financially successful, but they didn't make the right choice around if they're a business owner and they want to have that you know kind of personal skin in the game, or if they're a CEO where they don't quite control their destiny, but they also don't have the same you know downside of a personal guarantee. And I've seen people get that choice wrong and getting that choice wrong has a lot of cost to it. Not necessarily monetary cost, but lifestyle costs. So I really encourage people to understand what their avatar is before they go down this route. Then for me, uh, very simply, the reason I wrote this book, it is a low cost, low time investment first step to understand if this is a route that makes sense, that makes sense for you. And I give guidance about how you can you know, align it to your background, align it to your future aspirations and all that good stuff is ultimately the story that you want to tell to investors, to lenders, to the whole ecosystem, to business owners, to service providers, everybody is you want your story to be so simple that it's like, Hey, my name is David. I was destined to run business X, Y, Z, right? Because of these reasons here. And then it's like, cool. That's a person that like I want to back. That's a person that I want to invest in. That's a person I want to be successful. So I really coach doing that storytelling. When I teach this stuff, um, I really try to emphasize like what is your personal story and to make it as concrete as possible. I always make my students too, by the way, this will be a spoiler if you ever, you know, take one of the classes that I teach. I make students like take videos of themselves for like a minute that, that they're going to show like an intermediary because it's so important to get out, you know, in words, what your actual story is, because, you know, people are judging you all the time in this space. And it's just really critical to have those positive first impressions, because I don't actually believe that there's more credible searchers now than there were 20 years ago. There's certainly a lot more searchers. I don't know that the actual credibility amount has uh, has changed. So. Kind of went off on some tangents there. Hopefully that answered some of your questions. Yeah, I think it's a great way to kind of assess the data you're picking up. It's the investors, I think, are just trying to help you in a sense. They, many of them have uh, maybe more experience. And if you are not aligned in your mission, that's going to hurt you as much as it might their investment. One professor that kind of impressed upon me the uh, kind of long-term thinking was A.J. Wasserstein. Are you familiar with him in the ETA space. Yeah, great guy, great guy. I was kind of influenced by the shiny title, like, oh, CEO, that sounds nice. And then you start thinking about the uh, sacrifices you might make. And especially if that is, uh, if there's a misalignment, if you don't love being in a certain domain or, or what certain business. So it's really good to, to have those, ask yourself those questions and self-assess, as you said. Yeah. And it's critical to understand too, there's no right or wrong answer to this, quite frankly, but understand, do you want to be CEO? Do you want to be a business owner? Because I think people get that, they get that wrong all the time and there can be catastrophic, catastrophic consequences to it. So yeah, key takeaway, key takeaway, self-assessment. Other key takeaway is relationships. AJ Wasserstein's like an awesome guy. If I was doing a traditional search fund, I would want someone like AJ Wasserstein on my board. Why? Because I just like the guy. I find him like energetic. I find him spunky. He's the kind of person I want to spend time with. There's other investors in the space that, um, you know, they're good people. They're, they're, they're awesome. But I just don't feel that like they don't make my heart flutter, if that makes sense. Right. And I think it's yeah. just like a critical subjective thing for people to like put people in your corner that you that you just get along with and you can have that good, happy relationship with. 
I think that sometimes people try to check a box for industry experience or check a box for number of deals done. And that, and that to me feels transactional. I, I, I can't, I never done academic research on this stuff. So I can't, you know, tell you that it's, I can't say it's like fully data driven, but anecdotally, when I look out of it, some of the most successful searchers, CEOs or business owners that I see are just very strategic in who they surround themselves with. And oftentimes it's based more on the relationship capital than it really is on anything else. So when I look at people that I want to invest in or partner with, I just, quite frankly, the biggest criteria is, is this someone that I want to spend time with? Are they open to getting coaching from me? Are they going to make me a better person? I'm going to, am I going to learn as much from them as they're, as they're going to learn from me? And I think that's a critical part of it, a critical, but understated part of it in the space. Yeah, I fully agree. A couple of years back, I started to pursue mentors and I tried to make a point to provide value somehow to my mentors and it really helped with the relationship. And then I tried, I started with uh, getting a mentee and to my surprise, maybe, maybe it's not a surprise to you. I learned just as much from my mentee as I did from my mentor. So I try to recommend to everyone, like try to have at least one mentee and at least one, if not two uh, mentors. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the critical part of it, I mean, here's like the, the here's a, here's a key to teaching, right? I mean, no joke. I learn more from my students and they learn from me. And frankly, I always tell my students, you should be learning more from your classmates than you do from me. You know, these are the people that are really going to help drive the results for you going forward. Um, so yeah, absolutely. And it, it is, it is totally a two way street. And also too, you know, I talk about peer groups a lot in the book and I cannot express the importance of them enough because those relationships that you can have with your peers and business owner operator groups are great in this regard because everyone, you know, kind of gets the same challenges, but it's those peer relationships that really, to me, I've seen over the years drive the truly robust results. So it's not so much about, you know, listening to a podcast or, you know, having a relationship with somebody who's already been really successful. I think that the actual true effective and fulfilling relationships come from people that are almost equals to you. So I think both when searching for a business to buy and when operating a business to buy, having peer groups is critical. And there's a lot of them out there. There's no right one. There's no wrong one. But the guidance I would give to people that are listening here to your audience is in the same way that you diligence the business that you're looking at buying, diligence the peer groups out there. You know, uh, I'm an EO. EO could be a great fit for you. Uh, you might go to an event like SM Bash, which I absolutely love. You, you might just meet six people there that you create your own informal peer group. Uh, there's a guy named uh, Rand uh, that does Rand Run that, you know, has these awesome business owner peer groups. So these are all great, but you really got to find the one that just connects the most with you um, and then just go, uh, go all into it. So yeah, peer groups, critical part of the process. I talk about my experience shares about how my peer groups have saved me for myself. I had one team member at the industrial services business that left me at a very difficult time after I'd invested in a lot of him, which really devastated me personally. But I had my peer group around me to say, hey, Tileson, live by the words you speak, just go out there, hire a replacement, grit it done and get over yourself, you know? And in the absence of having that, I probably would not have had the same successful outcome that I did. So peer groups and power. You read my mind. I was just going to pivot into peer groups. I was going to ask you about what you've got out of the experience and you touched on that to an extent. And you also mentioned that you were in a few. Are you in a couple in addition to EO? Yeah, yeah. I'm in. Um, I'm actively involved actually in three right now. Uh, EO, wow. uh, one that is I got from business school and uh, another one that just kind of organically came out of some like-minded people. But my, my coaching, though, to people that are looking to buy a business is there's a lot of ways you can spend money as a searcher and a penny saved is a penny earned. <laughs> I mean, I would invest if there, if there was a paid peer group for searchers, I would in, I would join that. And, and, and if you are doing a traditional search fund and you have investors, I think you're going to get to an extent you can be a part of those but invest in that, like have people that are also searching around to combat lonely searcher syndrome, just to bounce ideas off of each other. And once you operate, yeah, I would join, I would join one immediately with a vision to join a second one going forward. Common misconception, which I outline in the book is that people think that you join a peer group once you're successful, completely wrong. You join a peer group to become successful. Right. Yeah. Well said. Let's talk about grit. I heard that character can't be taught. And to me, I associate grit with character. How would you purse the two? <laughs> well, it's going to be a common theme. I think that uh, 
character can be taught based on who you surround yourself with. And for better or worse, we surround ourselves with our parents and our siblings growing up, right? So for those that are, you know, parents in, in the group, and I, you don't need to hear this from me, but, you know, you lead by example and you have a very impactful, a lot of impact on your children. But ultimately, I think that the key to having uh, grit, and you know what's so interesting about grit too is, you know, Angela Duckworth, I, that book is just so fantastic, but you got to realize how much work it actually took for her to do the studies that actually led to that book. It wasn't like she woke up one day is like, hey, I'm going to do a study and write a, you know, do an academic paper and write a book. That journey was like the better part of, don't quote me, but like six or seven years for her. So she actually had to show a lot of grit to get that whole thing done. Mm -hmm. I think the critical part about it goes back to assessment. You just got to figure out what, where you can dig deep, what really inspires you to go out there and just take on the challenges that are going to come. I've always been able to do that in the world of small business for a variety of reasons. I've found inspiration from the people around me. I talked about the two professors at Chicago Boot that inspired me to go out and, you know, buy a company and have a greater than 10x return on it so I could go teach. Uh, one thing I didn't talk about, which is you know, maybe a little bit darker, but you know, the first fitness club that my older brother uh, invested in, it was not a good return for the first club, right? I mean, the club was cash flow positive. It did not go under, but you know, just say it wasn't a 30% IRR, but I was hungry. I was hungry to prove it to my older brother that I could go out there and uh, I could crush it in this system, you know, and I did ultimately. So uh, again, relationships are what drive so much for me of that grit. Angela Duckworth will tell you, and if you want to have fun, actually, go read the academic study that actually underpins grit, but grit is simply passion and perseverance. But to me personally, what actually drives those factors of passion and perseverance comes down to the power of relationships, comes down to the power of people and the power that the right people can have on instilling that incessant drive to tap into. So you are the sum of the people you spend the most time with. Right, so, uh, so true. So let's talk a little bit about your book, Good It Done. You've talked about the uh, the special offer through the end of the month for 99 cents, and then it gets an uh, 8x multiplier. Um, <laughs> still a, a reasonable price, I'm sure. But uh, what was your focus for writing this book? Why, what, what made you think I should write this book? Current median US wage is $1,118 per week, right? So gross it up to 70K a year. What I very strongly believe is that Someone can go out there and buy a business doing, uh, say it's doing $500,000 of EBITDA, 10% seller financing, 10% equity, 80% SBA 7A. Don't grow the business, just keep the EBITDA at 500K, sell it at the same multiple you bought it for in 10 years. You're going to make more money while you own the business. And after 10 years and the SBA debt is paid off, you're going to have a low seven figure pre tax exit. So you'll be a millionaire. During that time, you're going to be a business owner. So no matter what, you're going to have the autonomy of owning a business and not working for someone else, which feels good. And there's good academic research to back that up. Secondly, you're going to get a lot of painful people experiences, but you're also probably going to get some life-changing positive ones as well. So you're going to get some excellent life-changing relationships and you're going, to get, you're going to get a view of what good government can look like. So you'll feel freedom. You'll be happy. You'll have good relationships. You'll be happy and you'll become a better citizen. It is a no brainer for people to look at. Now, there's no shortage of private equity pros and searchers, people like me that are looking for that two to $3 million EBITDA business to buy, right? But there's a lot of imperfect businesses in that $500,000 range that I think it's just such a no brainer for the median wager in American to buy. That's like the core avatar that I wrote this book for. I put the frameworks that I've used that I personally use successfully. I put the experience shares about what it's actually like to run a business. I lay out the whole nine steps and it's valuable to be clear to MBAs. It's valuable to people that have money and want to buy bigger businesses. It's all kind of the same ball game, but the fundamental reason I wrote it is that uh, it's just as a give back to people that may not necessarily know that this opportunity exists and giving them a good first step in the process to go out and pursue it. Then once you read the book, and, uh, you know, you decide, hey, this makes sense, right? You can always, if you want to book a call for me, I'm currently booking calls like four to five weeks out, but I will always make the time to talk to somebody for a half hour because people did it for me. And then determine what the next step is. That next step could very well be an MBA. That next step could be taking a weekend workshop, right? That next steps could be, nope, I'm just going to go off and do this on my own, whatever you want to. Or it could be, you know what? 
I love business owners. I love business operators. I'm just not one. I want to stick with what I'm currently doing. And that's awesome. That's a victory too. So I just wrote it as a time efficient, cost efficient first step, because to me, fundamentally to be a better American is to be an entrepreneurial business owner. And I just, I get giddy about it. So I want to empower as many people as possible to go down, uh, to go down that route or at least consider it. Yeah, that's great. You mentioned in there that maybe not everyone wants to, or should be a business owner. I'd like to ask you the same question about becoming a board member. That's another thing that kind of kicks around in the back of one's head as they're looking at their career trajectory. Do you think the same thing could be applied to becoming a board member? Like it's got to be the right fit for you. And if so, how would you uh, define that? Oh, that's just a great question. So I ended up, I told you like the back deals that are SBA 7A and they're owner controlled, right? So there's one deal that I was involved in, experienced in the space, love the space. So it's like a great, it's a great board member seat for me to have that can add a ton of value to it. But this individual, because of the deal they were putting together, I was combining a variety of companies. And, and, and this is before the SBA had given the guidance about that you could do like permit transfers and keep the owner around, but the banks hadn't, it hadn't trickled down to the banks yet. So long story short, the individual could not do an SBA deal, right? And he had to do a deal where he was a CEO and not in control of the business, right? But I serve on the board and it's so interesting because I see this board from someone who's self-funded and a business owner, I'm now in the position of having fiduciary duty. So it's so interesting to be on that side of it. And, um, I gotta tell you, it's like an experience that I'm learning from in real time because I empathize with him as a business owner, but I also have fiduciary duty to the board members or to his investors, right? To those that put money into it, one of which I'm an investor too. So it's interesting. It all goes back to uh, that form of uh, that form, that form of assessment that I talked about, which I'm like, you know, kind of dealing with right now. <laughs> so I just wanted to thank you for laying some knowledge on us today. Clearly, you have a lot to give and you enjoy giving it. So we'll put the, uh, the book in the show notes. And uh, where would you like to direct people if they want to follow up with you or just see what you're doing? Yeah, uh, first step is griditdone.com to uh, get the book there. 99 cents to the end of May. Cannot stress that enough. And then also, uh, you know, I play around on LinkedIn. I'm active on Twitter, so you can feel free to engage. Uh, feel free to engage me, with me there. Uh, if you're ever up in Utah, ping me, and uh, we'll go for a, a hike or a morning cold plunge or something like that. I'm all about relationships and everything like that. Um, I want to ask though is that if you do request my time now that the book is done, I'm going to ask that you've actually read the book, so we can make it a good value add conversation. It's literally everything that I think is important to know. It'll lead to lots of follow-up questions, but read the book, come prepared, and we'll get a lot of uh, get a lot of value out of our out of our time together. That sounds great. Well, thank you very much for talking to us today, and uh, hope to talk to you again. Sounds good. After reading the book, of course.